Hi, I'm Robert Sanders and today I'm speaking to Leslie Thompson, who is the uh, author of the best-selling crime series Detective Daughter and she's here to talk to us about her success and to talk to us about her new novel that um, came out just yesterday. Um, so hello Leslie. Hi Robert, hi, it's lovely to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, first of all, just tell us a little bit about how you got where you are today, because um, you, I think your novel writing career is fairly late on uh, in your writing career. Is that correct? Not entirely. Um, uh, I, I, well, I've been writing since I could hold a pen. That, that's, that's um, you know, I was always writing stories when I was young. But I had my um, first novel published when I was 28. Um, it's called Seven Miles from Sydney. It was commissioned by... Uh, writer Jeanette Winterson because I'd sent a novel to the, at that point she was a, a commissioning editor for Pandora Press um, which was part of Routledge and Hegan Paul and um, I'd sent her a novel that I'd written and she said this is really for children well a young adults um, so they didn't really think it was right for their list but she said something that I mean it's, it's sort of what one, every writer would dream of she said you, you can obviously write. Um, this is this is great. I really enjoyed it. Would you write us a novel? Would you, you know? So she commissioned me to write a novel, which was just this was the eighties, uh, as I say. So I think you know it was pretty amazing, really. Um, it's not like I was a celebrity or anything. So I sat down and wrote a novel, which was Seven Miles from Sydney, and that did well at the time. I couldn't give up the day job as a result of it, but it, it um, was reviewed in the Guardian, which pleased my parents because they both read The Guardian so that was lovely and uh, it sold a lot of copies at the time um, but then I had a 20-year break for lots of reasons uh, partly simple one the day job um, all my day jobs had been about um, just earning money so that I could write because that was really all I ever wanted to do and every what tended to happen and it happened in the end in quite a big way was my the jobs I took on as jobs became careers and um, I ended up doing these jobs and that didn't leave a lot of time to write. I'm not one of those heroic people who, um, you know, come, do a sort of 10 hour day and come home and write or write on the train or whatever. Um, so I didn't write for 20. Well, I did write. I have got a couple of, it's not quite true, actually. I, I wrote a couple of novels which are now in the attic, she said, looking up. Um, uh, having been rejected several times um, and then I but mostly then I was concentrating on being sales manager customer services manager um, for, for um, an internet company one of the first internet companies actually my colleague and I were the only people we knew with an email address but anyway all of that to say that I started writing again in my mid-40s and I wrote a kind of vanishing um, which won a prize and um, what can happen when you win a prize is that um, people really take notice of you. So I got snapped up by a larger publishing company and I wrote The Detective's Daughter, which is the first in the series you were talking about. And um, that became a bestseller. So my, I suddenly was better known and I've been published ever since, which is lovely. But I was that that that, well, yeah, that was ten years ago. So you are right, you know. So and I could give up the day job. I mean, I still do other work. I, I teach um, on on an MA, for example. But but mainly my job now is to write. Wonderful, good. So um, and what makes you write? What keeps you going? What uh, what makes you write every day? Um, well, sometimes nothing, <laughs> which means I'm. <laughs> stomping about feeling very guilty that I haven't sat down in front of the computer but mostly I, I, I have I mean I feel slightly ill if I don't write I've heard other writers say this um, it's not guilt that makes me feel ill it, it's it's the stories inside that I want to tell and the need to, to uh, be creative perhaps I'm not sure but um, when I write I notice if I sit down to write I actually feel this immense uh, feeling of I've arrived, here I am. Good, off we go. And um, that, that's, that's probably, it's probably a physiological thing, I don't know, but that's what sort of definitely drives me. Otherwise it is, as I was touched upon then, it's, it is to tell stories 
I mean, I feel very lucky because I don't kind of just live in this world, if you like. Um, this is going to sound slightly kind of like slightly off with the fairies, but um, I, I, I'm inventing stories all the time. I'm seeing places and seeing possibility in those places. Um, somebody tells me, talks to me, and I, 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 I'll never write about a character, a real person. My characters aren't based on actual real people, but I might notice a tick that they have or just the way they say things or just them, their manner or, or something they're wearing. All of those things just get stored in this database and come out, you know, I can't even necessarily attribute it to where I first picked it up. It's just something I think of. So I think, you know, what I think really, I, I live in three different existences one like now where we're talking, reading um, and writing. And I feel very lucky to have that sort of extra dimension to my world, if you like. Mm. Yes. It's reassuring to know that you do have your, your moments when you're, when you're not doing it and you're, and <laughs> you're not oh. sitting. Oh, goodness me, yes. I mean, I sort of joke, Stella, my um, main character in the Detective Daughter series is... Um, a, de a cleaner by trade and only becomes a detective because she accidentally and rather unwillingly follows in her father's footsteps who was a detective um but i mean she absolutely loves cleaning it's her passion she'd rather you know do that than anything else and if someone offers her a deep cleaning job she's beside herself not me you know i mean that uh, i'm dyspraxic uh, which means i'm not great with left and right some people may know this of, of this it's a bit like dyslexia and it's connected, um, but it means I'm quite clumsy and um, you know, I'll, I'll often break my wear my watch um, partly like this on my inside of my wrist so that I don't bash it against door jams, which is what I was always doing because I'm because I'm not spatially very confident. Anyway, all of this to say that vacuuming is just the worst nightmare in the world. I mean, I get tangled in the flex. I do crash into the door jams. Um, I'd just be fine if there was no furniture in the room, but otherwise. So I'll, I, if I'm cleaning, I'm really desperate in terms of pro, um, procrastination and writing. <laughs> Actually, it's funny with, with the character of Stella because, because I think when you read a, a novel by an author, you assume that the, that the main character must have something like, be something like the author. And I've always thought, oh, maybe, maybe Leslie cleans a lot. Because um, there's an awful lot about cleaning and it's great. It's really interesting actually, but... Um, but, but clearly not. <laughs> I do get, I do get, well, they're not letters these days, but the, you know, the equivalent of letters from people saying, and, oh, I didn't know there was such a thing as a Venetian blind cleaner. And, uh, you know, oh, I, that was a great tip that Stella gave the other day. I'm doing that now. And, you know, so, I mean, one, somebody did suggest that I, that we, I brought out a Stella's, Stella's cleaning tips handbook. Um, but I don't think there are quite enough of them yet to make up a book. But, and also I think people would probably die of boredom. Who knows? But, <laughs> and, and if you're sort of giving advice to other authors what would you say are the qualities that are most important in gaining success as a writer um it's a funny one really i think it's almost not to concentrate on trying to be a successful writer oddly enough um i, I don't remember saying to myself at any point i want to be a famous writer or i want to succeed I just wanted to write a book that people would read, which of course meant I had to be published, certainly then in the 80s, and then following on from then. I mean, nowadays, well, you, I mean, in the old days, self-publishing was vanity publishing, and you knew that if you did that, you, if you had a garage, all your books would end up in your garage. So that, that wasn't really an option. Um, I just wanted to write stories, and I wanted to write the best story I could. And so I'd say, I think my advice would be for writers is, and I teach, as I say, so I discuss this with my students, is don't be, don't be so hung up on the success because you're outside the story if you're doing that. You're not within the, the world that you're creating. And what makes a really engaging book, to my mind, I think to most people's minds, is that you find the characters and the world in which they move plausible. And if... Um, if you are on the outside of the story thinking, well, readers will, might, would readers like this? And maybe I should have a bit more action at this point because that will keep people reading. You're not, you're not really inside your world. And if you're not inside your world, you can't really hope that your reader would be. 
So my advice is not to be thinking about how to be a successful writer, uh, in order, but, but to write the best story that you can, uh, show it to somebody who you trust in terms of both judgment and they're not going to suffer from some sort of envy um, and whose feedback you, you find helpful um, and then send it to an agent uh, and then see what follows from that. Um, but definitely, I think the first thing to do is have get the novel written and make it, you know, be as pleased with it as you can be beforehand. I don't know, how, how do you feel about that? What's, what's your, what are your thoughts, Robert? Well, I like, I, I like the way you talk about just get, you know, focusing on getting, the, doing the best you can and what you actually, what you actually can do and what you can actually produce and getting your story out. And, and, and I think, you know, I, I think a lot of the, a lot of the time people are trying to please people outside of themselves all the time. And because of that, they're not focused, as you say, they're not focused on themselves and not focused on doing the best, best quality work. So yeah, yeah, that certainly rings true with me. Um, and, and do you do, do you do a lot of research for your books? Yeah, um, I do tons. Um, I don't stray into what I call the Casubon effect, Mr. Casubon in Middlemarch, um, who, when he married Dorothea, she was horrified to discover that, you know, he'd been researching for years and years and years, but there was no book. And she said, why don't we start the book? I'll help you. I'll write out stuff. And he was absolutely horrified because he, he really, he didn't want to write a book. He just wanted to keep researching and talk about writing a book. So uh, I, I'm always careful not to fall slightly into that category in terms of there comes a point when you need to write. Um, but I do actually continue to research even as I write. Um, and for The Distant Dead, which cover, which I, book's next door, I didn't think to bring that, which came out yesterday, um, I um, was writing about a period that I haven't lived through for the first time in my life. I know my, I have, I, often my novels might have a, um, might be split between the now and a past, um, but it's been the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, where, which I was alive for. Um, but this, the novel I've just written is um, based in um, Blitz in London in 1940. And for that, I mean, my mum would have been, and my mum and dad are now dead, so they can't help me. I listened to a lot of stories when I was little growing up about um, my mum's family living in London and the Anderson shelter. And, um, so I, I but, but trouble is, you know, I, I mean, some of that's just in there, but I can't remember it literally. So I did a huge, I read lots of books about the home front in Britain during the war. I read a huge biography of, of Churchill, um, which was, um, really interesting actually. I mean, I gave myself a history lesson, I suppose, because we didn't do the Second World War at school. Um, I watched lots of um, propaganda films made at the time um, by, for example, Humphrey Jennings, who was really quite an interesting director. Things like Fires Were Started was one of them, how, how they dealt with, because a lot of the damage was, you know, sentry bombs dropping and then setting fire to buildings. So, and that's how people, you know, died in fires and all buildings were just gutted as well as being literally bombed. Um, so yeah, I did a huge amount um, that I was, I was locked down, of course. So where I often do interviews with people who are perhaps doing the jobs that I am writing about, um, I'm detective's daughter, for example. I mean, I have talked to somebody who runs a cleaning company and I have talked to somebody who drives an underground train in London, which is one of my other characters, Jack. Uh, and I've been on an underground train. I, mean, I don't mean as a passenger, obviously I have, but I was, t I was taken in the cab of an underground train. And so I had the felt experience of um, being in the front of a train as opposed to sitting in a train, looking out sideways and seeing all the cables when you're in the tunnels or you know, whatever is going past the window. Um, and that was as much to get a sense of where all the, you know, where all the um, dials and levers were but it was also um, to get that, as I say, the felt experience of being in a tunnel that's going over you as opposed to past you. And uh, Frank, the driver, was brilliant and told me, you know, things like, I notice how the dust is, um, there's tons of dust in the underground. Um, that comes up in the story in relation to Stella and her cleaning thing. Because I mean, Jack, Jack works in a world of dust, basically, because it's full of dust, all the tunnels. Um, but he talked about the dust lighting up in the in the headlights of 
the train and 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 the front the, you know you can hardly it's very the headlights are very dim and you only see the rails that are just in front uh, and they light up as you come along them and it's like they seem to sort of appear as the, as the train moves it's fascinating so all of that kind of thing so my research is as i say it's interviewing it's it's experiencing and it's um, reading and watching films as uh, secondary material or primary material actually some of it um, but I, I hoped that I could actually go to the Kew archives, for example, the National Archives in Kew, mm. um, to look up uh, various bits and bobs, um, as well as the Keep, which is here down in Sussex, um, for other papers. And of course, we were in lockdown last year when I was writing the novel, so I couldn't do any of that. So I had to entirely rely on the internet, um, the newspaper archive, which I belong to, British newspaper archive. Um, which is a great writer's resource. You know, it gives you um, access to, um, well, newspapers of all the different eras and different newspapers. And, and that, that, that was actually a huge mine of information for me to, to see what sort of reports were being, were out there in 1940. So yeah, a very long answer to a shorter question. I do a lot of research, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and the, your new book, The Distant Dead, you say it's set in the 1940s. Um, are there uh, parallels there with, um, or connections there with what, what hap what's happened over the last year? Oh yes, I was, it was purely by accident actually, because I planned the novel in 2019, uh, before we knew anything about the pandemic. Um, I, the inspiration initially came from, I was saying, you know, my mother's family, you know, she grew up in London, her father was a prison officer at, um, well, various prisons, but uh, while he was at Pentonville, he was asked to sit with a, a young um, German spy or Nazi spy. He's actually from somewhere else, it wasn't German, but um, uh, overnight before he was hanged in the morning. Um, and he wrote a little message for my grandfather on the back of a cigarette packet, which I saw as a child because it was in the family box. Um, and, uh, when I was, we, I'm, we moved house in, 20, well, earlier this year, but I was clearing out the attic um, the year before last and um, found the photocopy of this, this cigarette box. My uncle's got the original. And that just set me thinking, you know, I saw his handwriting and what he'd said. Um, and it put me into that era, but I, I didn't want to write a spy story because I'm a crime writer and I'm not, I mean, I don't mind, you know, I don't dislike spy stories, but it's definitely not me. You know, so but but it, it set me thinking about the home front during the war, and um, basically I came up with an idea that was set then, and started to write it. I mean, it's partly based in the present day because it's a cold case that is then looked back on. Um, and um, as I was writing, which was last year, of course we were in lockdown, and I started to see the parallels, and other people did too because there was you know there was. There were interviews on the radio with people. And, um, somebody actually wrote an academic paper on the comparison between 1940 and 1920, 2020. Um, and I was seeing these parallels for myself because I was getting the sense of what it was like to be living during the war with all those privations and um, rules that, that they had, um, right down to masks, you know, like us. The government was encouraging, well, no, they were telling people to wear a mask, um, you know, and to always remember to take your mask and they had gas mask parties uh, which people went to with gas masks I mean there were so many ways they took to try and get people to to do what was necessary uh, for the war effort as we have experienced now for the like the pandemic effort um, right down in fact to the the slogan we're all in it together which was originally used then um, and uh, so while I think that I mean you know there are lots of you could have lots of debate about, well, was it harder then? And yes, I think finally it was much harder then. You couldn't pretend that there wasn't a war going on, whereas some people can pretend or, or can act as if there isn't a pandemic. Um, you know, people sometimes not wearing masks in the street and what have you, whereas then, you know, it was coming from above, everyone had to have blackout curtains, etc. So it was very, you know, it was, I, I think it was without doubt, much, much more stressful then. But there was the similar stress that we were, I mean, to some extent we were, or we are all in it together, and we have all been affected in some way by it, in the same way that people were during the war. So I definitely did see parallels, and 
the way I used that, I think, was in the mindset. I found myself in feeling as if I was back in 1940. Um, and I, that did nothing but help the novel, I hope. Good, good. And um, what, what are your plans for, you know, what are your plans for next? What, what are you doing next? Um, well, um, just before we started to talk, I'm working on a novel that's a standalone. Uh, it will come out next May. It's called The Companion. And it's um, based on the, uh, an idea that I may have heard of, may, many people may have heard of it, um, where you can go and live with a person who's older than yourself. So, um, and, and for, for have a lodge in their, one of their rooms in their home. And um, for a relatively cheap rent, you, you offer 15 hours of your time to be a companion to them. Um, which is a lovely idea, of course, warm and lovely and, you know, but then, of course, being a crime writer, I started to think, but what if that went wrong? And how could that go wrong? So um, that, that's kind of the story, I guess, um, uh, what, you know, about, well, the companion. Um, and as I say, yeah, so I'm on the first draft at the moment. So I'm in that position that we all know of ahead of me is only a blank page and I have to keep plowing on occasionally thinking, oh God, I'm not sure about this. If I'm really not sure, I don't write it. But if I'm slightly sure, I do write it. And I just keep going to get that draft done. So I've got something to work with. Um, but yeah, it's my least favourite part of, of writing a novel, I have to say. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have a daily routine? Yes, on the whole I do. Um, because we moved house, things have been a bit upended. But yes, mainly... Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's sort of get up, take the dog for a walk. And that's a lovely experience because we meet up or one, one of us meets up with a group of dog walkers we've known for years now. Um, we all know the dogs and we're all friends anyway. So by breakfast, I've had a big social encounter, which is quite enough for a writer. So that's good. Come back for breakfast and then round about sort of half eight, nine o'clock, sit down here at the keyboard um, and there is a bit of procrastination, that might be emails and various things, but also a bad habit I have is writing, going back over what I've just written. And that's a piece of advice I would say to people not to do on the whole. Uh, I mean, in the, in the end, you'll find your own style, but I can tell when I'm a bit kind of, mm, when I go back over something I've written rather than just go straight on, because you can, you can correct or change or redraft later. Uh, and, uh, but mostly I do just plow straight on. Um, work till one o'clock, lunch. I generally, if it's the first draft, I'm still researching. So in the afternoon, I'll be doing more reading, um, and making notes. Um, but if, I'm, if it's the second draft, I, I carry on. I mean, I'm not so creative in the afternoon, which is why, uh, you know, trying to write new stuff after lunch in the afternoon, I've always been like this, not an age thing. I find just um, my brain is sluggish. I'm a morning person. So, um, and then one way or the other finish about five o'clock. So yeah, I, I mean, I try and write every day and that includes weekends, even if it's only like an hour, uh, just to stay in touch with the story. And because I'm constantly thinking about it and suddenly an idea, and I've long ago realized I can't think, oh, that's a good idea and do nothing about it. I have to write it down. I won't remember otherwise. Um, okay. Well, I mean, the, in the olden days, when when I would like be out walking the dog, and we didn't have um, uh, record, you couldn't record on your phone, you didn't have you know smartphones. Um, I would leave my leave a message for myself on the answer machine, and come back and think, oh, somebody's phoned me. How lovely! And then listen to the message. It would say, "Hide the knife under the pillow." And you'd hear me slightly out of breath because I was walking. So the whole thing was quite alarming, really. But it, did, it was one way of, remi of rem reminding myself, yeah, you need to do that. Because I knew I wouldn't remember by the time I got home. So, yes. <laughs> do, you, do you have a routine? Are you, are you a routine sort of person? Uh, I try to have a routine. I've got an um, eight-year-old daughter. So she, she keeps me in routine to a certain extent. I bet. Uh, yes. uh, and yes. like you, I am a morning person. So morning is my time for when I'm not seeing clients is my time for um, writing. I, I write a lot of articles and things or planning or marketing or all the 
those sorts of things. And yeah. like you, by the time I've got to lunchtime, if things are starting to flag and I choose to read or, or something like that, there's a little bit less less proactive, but maybe still still learn something. Yes. It did, I think a routine is important. Yeah. Oh gosh, yes. I think it is for everything. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much for the interview today, today Leslie, um, and it's been great talking to you, and um, I look forward to reading The Distant Dead, um, and uh, I hope lots of other people will too, and um, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Bye.